cool. Welcome to the Allison Loves Math podcast. My name is Allison Dillard. I am an author, adjunct math professor, and the founder of Raise a Math Person. And on this podcast, I'll be interviewing math education and parenting experts to talk about ways that we can empower our children and students to succeed in math, STEM, school, and life. I'm very excited today to have Brent Monty on as a guest. He is the head of the math department at Irvine Valley College. He has a bachelor's in business finance, a master's in mathematics, a PhD in education. He worked for a few years as a financial analyst and accountant, and then for the last 28 years has been teaching and still loves it today. And he's a marathon runner with, was it, how many marathons is it, Brent? I think about 32. 32, that is amazing. So welcome to the podcast. It's so good to have you here today. Thank you, Allison. It's great to be here. So one of the reasons why I wanted parents and teachers to hear from you is that you you just have a knack for getting students enthusiastic about math. The story that I'm, I'm always hearing from students, you know, when I talk to students or when I overhear them talking about different math professors, you know, is that, you know, they were, they were always bad at math. They always hated math until they had your class. And the, the level of enthusiasm that your students have for, for you and for math, you know, is something that I know lots of, of teachers um, as well as parents are really aspiring to, um, but struggle with. So, you know, one of the things I just wanted to ask you today is, you know, what are some tips that you have for, for parents and teachers who are just struggling to get students to um, enjoy math and, and work at it? Well, I think one thing that you have to bear in mind is especially with math, a lot of students are intimidated by it and don't feel that they really have a natural knack for it. And so I think one thing that's important is just, just be very inviting. Don't pretend you're the smartest person in the room. You're more educated probably than most of the other people in the room, at least in mathematics, that's why they're in your class. But they're smart, you're smart, you're just working together for a common goal of getting them to understand the material. And so I feel it's my job just to help them understand what I understand. And it's kind of as simple as that when I look at it is I know some stuff that they don't know yet, but if we work together and they're willing to put in their part, I'll put in my part to give them whatever tools they need to help them understand it so that they can do it and be successful. Right. No, that's a great, I, I can see how the, the working together sort of, I don't know, mindset as a teacher, right, is really helpful because I think students often come into class sort of expecting, not expecting that, right? They, they have that, this idea of, you know, there's, there's the teacher and there's the lecturer and then there's me over here and, and we're on almost opposite sides, right? Not necessarily together as a team. So I really like that sort of, I don't know, I guess team mindset almost. Yeah, no, and I think it puts that student in that mindset that they're part of the class. They're not just an outside observer and that I'm up in front of the room, you know, telling everybody what I know, showing how smart I am. I'm there to help them know what I know. Right, right. And I know one of the things that you had mentioned earlier also, um, you know, when we were talking before was that, you know, patience with students can have a big impact also. Um, how how does that work? You know, I think I think we all we all want to be patient with students, yeah. right? But it's 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 harder than than it, it looks. So, what is your advice for that? Well, I do know one thing, and interestingly enough, because I'm very patient, I've been told by my students I'm very patient, and it's because I don't know what they know. I don't know how quickly they catch on to things. I do notice I have to be careful when I'm helping my own my own kids with math that I have to be extra patient with them. Because sometimes I think, well, you should know this. You know, you're not trying or something like that. And I don't do that with my students because I don't know where they're coming from. So I think if you treat everybody, your own kids, students in the class, whoever it may be, if you treat them like, well, they're doing the best they can. They're trying to understand the material. Um, and so when I teach them something, if they don't get it the first time, that's fine. You know, I'll teach it to them again. I'll try to use different words. Students absolutely don't like it when they ask you a question and you just repeat what you said before. I've had students tell me, you know, I hate it when a teacher, you'll ask them a question 
and you'll say, oh, I didn't understand that. And they explain it the exact same way, the exact same words. And it's like, no, it's not that I didn't hear you. It's that I didn't <laughs> understand you. And so I try to bring up examples. I try to relate it to things they may have more in common with, um, or I at least try to show it maybe a slightly different way, at least use different words to see if maybe that helps illuminate the idea a little bit. Oh, I think that's good. And, you know, I think I struggle with the same thing with my kids in terms of having that similar patience with them that I do with students in class, because, you know, especially you know, I've taught a few of these, um, the pre-algebra classes, you know, at IVC where it's the, it's the lowest level of math that a student would place into. And, you know, it was really surprising the very first time that I taught it, how much students may have missed, you know, in, in their mm -hmm. elementary and junior high and high school math. And so that was really an eye-opener in terms of, I think, that the patience thing, right? In yeah. terms of realizing that, you know, they might not understand this concept because they actually don't understand so many of the foundations. And so sort of digging into that is important. And I, I definitely, um, I think I forget to do that with my kids sometimes, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, well, because you, even if you're going along with them with the math in their education, it's very easy for them to forget things that they've learned in the past, you know? Sure. Well, and we do that as teachers. We expect, well, you were taught this three years ago. Why don't you know this? Well, <laughs> you know, obviously we see it time and time again. So we remember it and they may not have used it in, you know, three years or even if they haven't used it in three weeks, it's not at the tip of their fingers. Um, and so it's not as easy. But I was going to say one thing we have to realize in classes, especially sometimes students that are asking us questions, they may have never asked a question in class before because they're intimidated. Yes. And if they ask us a question in class and they feel like we're treating it like a dumb question or we kind of, you know, brush it off as, well, that's not as important, they may not ask a question ever again in that class. Maybe not even in another class if they feel equally intimidated. So I think it's really important to make the students when they ask questions, make them feel validated. You know, make them feel that, yeah, you know, you have every, every right in the world to ask a question, even if you think it's a dumb question. It's my job to answer your question and try to get you to understand the material. So I think we do have to be really careful, especially if it's a student that hasn't spoken in class before, that we make it so that they feel safe and so that they feel like, oh, I can ask a question again another time because I was scared to ask this question. Nothing bad happened. Right. And in fact, I understood this stuff a little bit better. And even if it's not that student, they see how you're treating the other students. And if they don't like the way you respond to another student, they may sit there and say, I'm never going to ask a question. In class. I don't want that to happen to me. So I, I think it's just how you treat people, if you treat them with respect, and if you treat them, you know, if you're nice to them, they're going to do their best. I mean, they're in the class because they want to learn. Right, right. And I think that's a really difficult thing, actually, to create that class environment where students feel comfortable asking questions. You know, it's, I don't think nobody goes out of their way to, to create an environment where students are scared to ask questions. I think it, it happens accidentally. And, and I've definitely found that, you know, I, I really, you know, the first couple semesters teaching was like racking my brain, trying to figure out mm -hmm. how to create that environment. And, and I think, you know, like you said, it's, it's really that focus on not making students feel stupid when they ask a question. And then one of the other things I found too is that if you're pointing out that the question is helping other people, you yeah. know, and, and, and just, and then showing that like, look, it helped everybody, then it helps them to feel better about it as well. And it also helps them to feel like they're not alone in not understanding it. Right. You know, I think when I hit that moment with the students where they realize that like, everybody else is also struggling with because math is hard they're all everybody's struggling to get through it you know um that that helps a lot yeah no i think that's a good point and i think that's a great way to do it because if they feel empowered i mean not only was it acceptable for me to ask this question mm -hmm. but if i helped other people at the same right. time yeah no i think that's a great idea yeah and i think you know, and again, just, you know, coming out of, you know, those first few semesters of teaching and, and thinking so much about that, I think just sort of like how we, you know, 
spend some time thinking about our lesson plans, right? And how we're going to actually teach the math concepts. You know, if you're struggling with that sort of class environment, it can be helpful to approach it in the same way and actually think about it before class. How am I going to create that positive environment for the students and, and sort of and tweak it as you go and improve it the same way that you do, you know, teaching the math concepts. Yeah, no, I agree. And, I, and there's such a big difference between being a math teacher and being a mathematician. Mm. So you may, you may know math really well. And I will be perfectly honest, I think at my school, out of our math department, I'm not one of the ones that knows math at the top of the school at all. I relate to the students, you know, as well or better than a lot of the other instructors. Um, and that's, that's, that's what the students care about. If they, if I know math and really, but I can't explain it to them, it doesn't help. You know, if I'm teaching high level mathematics, you know, if I'm at the graduate level or at least junior, senior level of math, you know, it's really important that I understand the concepts super well, but you know, anything, especially freshman, sophomore, remedial levels, we know it well enough. I mean, we all have masters in math, or even if we have a bachelor's in math, or even if we're a parent that just has a math background from taking classes, as long as you can, you know, explain it and make the students feel comfortable. Um, yeah. No, I think I think to the student. Yeah. I've had students say a lot of times, well, you could tell this person really understood math really well. They just couldn't explain it very well. And that's, you know, oftentimes the students don't want to take that teacher. Right, right. And, you know, honestly, I think what you're saying is true, even for the, the higher levels of math, you know, because if, if you think back to when you were in school and taking, you know, classes for like your master's, right? And I, I know I found this, you know, even for those really, really hard math classes, um, you know, having a teacher who actually, who, who cared about mm -hmm you know, your success, who created that environment where you can ask questions and stuff like that. All of those things really added to, you know, enjoying the class and enjoying math and continuing mm. with it and all, all of those things. So, um, you know, I think yeah, at all levels, actually, that's really helpful. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. Other, other, other tips for teachers? Gosh. Or parents. I, I think one thing that I think it's important for you to have fun doing it as well. Mm -hmm. So if you're not enjoying it, it's going to come across to the students. I, I'm a co-chair of the math department. And so I'll go in. One thing, I'll be interviewing people for full-time jobs. And you see teachers that come in and they're, uh, obviously they know the material, but they come across and just their personality is a little bit condescending. Mm. Or, and they don't, they're not meaning to. Right. And I think sometimes you have to be very conscious about that and you have to realize, you know, how am I coming across to the students? And you want to come across as somebody that they want to converse with. If yeah. you're, you know, if you're just coming across as the smartest person in the room, it's like, well, that's good. Good for you. Yes, I'm very proud of you. You're very smart. <laughs> but I don't want to ask you questions because I just feel dumber in comparison. Right. So I, I think that's an important thing. Um, but yeah, like we said, it's just, if you're having fun and the students know that you're enjoying what you're doing, then they're going to be set at ease a lot more and they'll be more apt to have fun because I mean, let's face it. Most if you say, Hey, what's your, what's the class you go to to have the most fun? Not very many of them are going to say, Oh, my math class. That's just a <laughs> right. So, so we realize that and a lot of us enjoy math. I enjoy math and I appreciate math. I don't consider myself a mathematician because I don't love math, but I absolutely love teaching. So I love that, that aha moment or the moment like you were talking about when students are saying, hey, you know what? I've, I've never understood this before, but that makes sense. I, I see what you mean by that or I see how I would really be able to apply this in real life. So, or I can do this that's when it, you know, that's when it gets really, that's when it gets really good is when a student has that moment where they've self-actualized and they're saying, you know what, I've always been bad at math, but 
but this makes sense. I, I think I can actually do this. I can get back. Yes, I love that. I love those moments. I think that's one of or the most rewarding thing about teaching. You know, I think that's what makes it a, a job that is so different, so much better. I'll say better, fine, I'll say better <laughs> than so many others, you know? Um, yeah, let's, let's be honest, it's just better. <laughs> it's just better, I know. <laughs> and so, yes, I think having fun is, is an important thing too. It's such a good point, right? To remember to have fun with it. And I know you'd mentioned that like, you've been teaching for 28 years, right? Yeah. And you yeah. still love it, you still have fun with it. What are some, I don't know, suggestions you have for teachers to, you know, maybe teachers who are feeling a little bit burnt out or overwhelmed, or just maybe they started off having fun with it, but, you know, they just maybe aren't anymore. Do you have, you know? Well, that, that's a good question, yeah. and I think you just kind of have to go back to the basics. You know, ask yourself, why did I get into this profession? You know, is there, is there a reason I became a teacher if the reason was I want to have summers off or the reason was I like to make my own schedule. You know, there's, there's other jobs where you can do that sort of thing. But if your reason to go into teaching was because you wanted to make a difference, because you wanted to connect with students, because you wanted to pass on information, any of those things, ground yourself back into the reason you got into it. You know, look for, for reasons, you know, are you, you know, how are you coming across to the students? If you're not enjoying it, and I've, I've seen faculty evaluations where what the students say is, you can tell this person knows what they're doing, but you can tell they don't want to be there. They don't want to be teaching. Right. And a lot of times there are some good perks to being a teacher, you know, the summer's off, the, you know, some of the time that you have that is, you know, you can choose what time you're going to do something. If you want to grade late at night or early in the morning or the middle of the day and, you know, you have some of that flexibility as a teacher. Oh, I want to teach this. I don't want to teach that. So you do, you do have a lot of autonomy in that regard. Um, but students know if you don't enjoy what you're doing, you know, the other stuff's good, but you're in teaching to be a teacher. Um, and if you're not enjoying it, you know, maybe you should look at potential other careers, but you know, I, I think grounding yourself and going back and saying, okay, why did I get into this? And what changed? Am I still enjoying it? If not, why not? You know, am I putting in the work? Am I, am I learning new techniques? You know, because obviously over the years, students change. You know, a student that's coming into my class this year is different than my student that came into the class 10 years ago or 20 years ago. But can you relate to them you know, is the learning style change? Does your teaching style have to change? Do you have to adjust? Because it's not, I think that's one thing as we teach longer and longer is we get to the point where we say, well, the students are different. Well, yeah, so maybe you have to be different to connect with the students. Don't expect them to come in to adjust to you. Right. You might have to adjust to the students. And I'm not saying dummy down the curriculum. I'm not saying you know, let them pass when they shouldn't pass. Mm -hmm. But maybe the way that they interpret things, maybe the way that they understand things, maybe the way that you motivate them to do their work, you know, those types of things change. And maybe you need to take classes or, you know, watch podcasts and things like that to get ideas on, you know, how can I become better? Right, right. And I think it's helpful too to see that as a positive thing, right? Not like, oh, I have to do this to, you know, yeah. improve. But honestly, I think, you know, we feel better when we're learning and improving. It's, it's sort of a, one of those um, things yeah. that they say you should do in order to, to be happy. If you want to improve your happiness, like learn new things and improve yourself, you know? Um, so, so that can, I don't know, help a lot. I really yeah. like that. Really no, that's like very that. interesting. And I completely agree. Because sometimes you sit there and you're like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go to that class. I don't want to. But once you do and you're learning new things, it kind of reinvigorates you. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I did that. So yeah, I, I think that's an excellent point. And so actually, so I have another question for you, actually, since for someone who is an adjunct professor, um, who's been hesitant to apply to be full-time because of just that, the balance, right? And, and we're just sort of talking about burnout and stuff. And I, I am worried long-term about how I would balance 
teaching as a full-time job and not get burned out. Um, you know, so I don't know, do you have, do you have advice for that actually for how to balance everything and for, yeah, I guess it's, it's really a balanced question. How do you balance all of it? One of the good things, especially teaching at community college, I mean, we get to essentially pick our schedule. We get mm -hmm. to essentially pick what classes we want to teach, at least the school I teach at. Mm -hmm. We get to pick the classes we want to teach at. We, want to, we get to pick the times we want to teach. And we get to essentially make our own schedule. We can teach extra classes if we want to or we don't have to. We can teach summers or not. Mm -hmm. So we do get a lot of that. And I, I remember when I was early on to teaching, you know, I would teach everything that I could. Oh, I need the money and I need, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to teach over the summer. And, but, you know, I found out that, you know, that balance is really important. I remember I was teaching the night class when my kid was really young and he was asking me, I'm going to get all emotional. He was asking me, Are, is tonight your late night? And I was like, yeah. <sighs> Let's just say I didn't have the balance. Yeah. 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 You know, especially I think with, with kids, right? That's they're a, a reminder always to, to balance because those that time goes by very quickly, right? And we yeah. don't want to miss out on that. No, that's a good point. And so, but I, I, I think that's important is you have to balance and you have to see, you know, what, what motivates you, what recharges you. And I know there's sometimes over the summer, it's like, oh, school's starting in a couple of weeks. I'm not ready to go back. And then that first day back in the classroom, I'm reinvigorated. I'm like, oh, I'm so glad to be back in class. So, and it, it it's just understanding yourself. You know, mm -hmm. if you get recharged in the classroom, then make sure you're in the classroom. If you get recharged doing research, you know, do research. Um, but it is, it is that balance. If you need your family time, if you need time to exercise, if you need time to, you know, if you're into art or music or you like to read, whatever it is, make sure you take that time to recharge yourself right? so that you can do the best at your job. But, but yeah, that, that life balance is just so important. And don't try to do too much i heard a quote once that said you can do anything you want to you just can't do everything you want to and, yes. like, mm. and, and i'd imagine you you understand that you know better than most yes i totally i feel <laughs> like i come back to that all the time because mm -hmm. my mind goes just a million miles an hour of all the different things that I could do. And then I constantly have to come back and just sort of streamline and be like, no, nope, gotta remember, you can't do everything. <laughs> you just gotta yeah. focus on focus on the most important things. And like you were saying, the things that that recharge you and that you enjoy the most. Um, and that's interesting. I, I love the way you described it in terms of coming back to school, because sometimes I feel guilty that when we we're starting the new semester, I'm like, oh gosh, we're starting the new semester. <laughs> you're right, the very first day back in class, you're like, you know what? It's in the classroom. It's not the, it's not prepping everything and getting yeah. all the modules set up that, that energizes me, but it's being in the classroom and, and you're back on day one. You're like, oh, yep. I remember why I love this. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, that's how you know you're a teacher. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> definitely. That's no, that's true. My you're my husband, who's not a teacher, he's he's the exact opposite. He's like, oh my gosh, if I had to go and be in a classroom for even just an hour teaching, he was like, I'd be exhausted and miserable the whole rest of the yeah. day. It's definitely, no, and, you know, different personalities. Yeah, I completely see that. <laughs> so, you know, speaking of all of these things, then you know, since so many teachers are teaching online right now do you have do you have suggestions for you know all, all of these different things that we've covered you know in terms of you know getting students you know engaged and enthusiastic or you know maintaining your own enthusiasm for teaching um how how do we do that when we're online well i know one thing that worked for me and at the college level would be different than the high school level um i'd imagine but i'm not sure is when we had to go online last semester at the end of the semester um, I noticed when I was doing live Zoom sessions for class, there was no interaction. We'd be talking and I'd be lecturing. Hardly anybody would say anything and ask questions. And in class, when we're in the classroom, students are interrupting me all the time. I'm putting a problem on the board. I'm like asking, okay, here, do this at your desks. And then, okay, you know, I give them a couple minutes and then I ask, okay, who, who can solve this? And they yell out answers and things like that. And then that was missing in my lecture. So what I did is I essentially flipped the classroom. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. I pre-made all my lectures because I said, well, they're not going to interact anyway. <laughs> I will just do the lecture. Right. Cut it down because I know they can rewind and watch examples over again. So I cut down my lectures for maybe an hour of lecture to 20, 30, 35 minutes, put them on YouTube. I have the students go to YouTube first and watch the lectures. And then when we come to class, we meet at the regular class time, but they can ask questions on the homework. They can ask questions about anything they didn't understand. So I get to spend a lot more time on the homework than I had time to in class. Right. So the students have the lecture and let's face it, even if you get a very interactive class, 80% of the class doesn't participate or ask questions during class anytime. They're just sitting there watching. Right. Well, they can do that on the video. Mm -hmm. But now students that weren't participating in class are much more apt to say, hey, can you show me how to do problem 16? Or, you know, what did you mean by this? And so a lot of times I think students aren't as fearful because they don't have a classroom of students looking over at them saying, who's asking this question? Don't you understand it? And right. so they don't have that fear of, well, I'm going to stand out if I ask this question, because as you were saying, everybody else knows this. It's just me. Obviously, that's not true, but that's how a lot of times students feel. I remember feeling that way in classes, especially math classes. Oh, I was like, I'm not getting it. And everybody that's talking is getting it, not realizing, well, there's only four students in the class that are talking. Okay, <laughs> those four get it, but what about all the rest of the students? Um, so it, it worked for me putting the lectures on video. And then now when I meet with class on Zoom, then we can really interact a lot more. And they still don't interact as much as I'd like to, as much as they did in the class, but at least they can ask specific questions and I can answer specific questions and go over the homework problems and spend more time with them that way than just lecturing. Because they, they don't want to participate much in a lecture if it's a, you know, more of a, a literature class or something where you're getting input and looking at different ideas and what did the author mean here? But with math, you know, it's pretty cut and dry. And you mm -hmm. say, okay, here's this problem. Here's how we solve this. There's not a lot of debate about how we're going to solve it. <laughs> so for the most part, it's, there's not that torque, that sort of give and take. Mm -hmm. Right, but it's, right. it is definitely a challenge to get the students involved and active. Mm -hmm. And the more lecture you can do ahead of time that they can watch, the more time it gives you to be interactive. And so that's, at, at least that works better for me. Mm -hmm. It's not ideal, but. Oh, that's a great idea. I do enjoy that. Right. Yes. No, that's a great idea. I think, you know, I think I sort of did um, in the spring sort of an abbreviated version of that. You know, mm -hmm. I, it, what you said actually is exactly what I tried. I was like, oh, I'm going to record all my lectures ahead of time. And I didn't realize I'm not used to recording my own lectures and I hate my own voice. And so I, 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 I tried to do the first one and then I was like, I must have recorded like the first problem like seven times. And I'm like, oh, this is not going to work at all. So then I just, I told the students, I was like, look, I'm going to record the lecture, you know, live on Zoom at this time. So that way, if you want to join me, you can. And actually just having some of the students there who did want to see it live enabled me to push through and oh, not worry about getting it perfect and just record the whole thing because yeah, it weirded me out just um, lecturing to nobody. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I think you're more of a perfectionist than I am. Although I'll watch, I usually don't watch most of the videos that I do. I'll make sure that they recorded properly and stuff. And sometimes I'll watch them like, ooh, that was a good example. Oh, that was, and so sometimes I'll say something that's pretty good. And sometimes I'll say, oh, I should have said this. Or, you know, I didn't write that very clearly. But I, luckily for me, I'm not that much of a perfectionist. So I let it go. You know, um, and, and I'm not either. And I had to, I knew that I had to <laughs> let go of that perfectionism for that because, Otherwise, there's there's so many so much to record when you're lecturing, and it's it's lecturing as a teacher. You only have time to lecture. You don't have time to like make perfect right. videos, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, that was that was a very interesting um, learning moment. Right when we moved online. <laughs> that is funny. Yeah. Oh man. Oh man, we are. Um, I can't believe we are out of time already. Um, I'd wanted to ask you a little. Actually, let's 
we've got a couple more minutes. I want to ask you <laughs> a little bit about just how you got into teaching because I know you that wasn't exactly um, what uh, you started out doing. So can you just tell me just you know a little bit about? Yeah, your I'll, I'll give you. There? Yeah, let me give you a brief about that because I started out I was going to be an engineering major and I went to community college and I had a physics class. I was like, I'm not going to be an engineering major. So I thought, well, I'll be a math major. And I would tell people, oh, I'm going to be a math major. And they're like, well, what are you going to do, teach? I was like, oh, good heavens, no, I'm not going to teach. <laughs> and so I decided I'd, I got out of math because I knew I didn't want to be a teacher, and I went into business. And then I was in business. I got my bachelor's in business, as you mentioned, and I worked for a CPA firm. And I was sitting there studying for the CPA exam thinking, I don't want to do this. I don't enjoy this job. And at that point, I thought, I need to do something else. And I remembered I was a tutor at the math center when I was in community college, and I loved it. And I did some private tutoring, and I thought, you know what? I want to go into teaching. And interestingly enough, I had it narrowed down to either math or creative writing. I wanted to teach <laughs> oh, one that's of those. And I didn't know which one I wanted to do. And I ended up choosing math because I figured, well, that's going to be a lot easier to grade the test. <laughs> I remember trying to grade people's essays when we were just, we'd pass out essays in class and read each other's essays. And I, I knew I kept trying to make their essay my essay. And I was like, well, I'm not very good at that. So I thought, well, I'll go into math because I knew I wanted to be a teacher. And that's why when people say, oh, well, you're a mathematician. It's like, yeah, I'm a teacher who teaches math, right. but I don't consider myself a mathematician because I didn't get into teaching because I love math. I got into it because I love teaching. Right. And I think that's one of the things that makes me more relatable to the students is that I, I enjoy teaching. I'm not just, hey, I love math. Now, if I love math and I want to help other people love it too, then, you know, you're really on to something. Um, but so I, you know, it was kind of a circular route. But my advice to students and anybody else is if you don't love what you're doing, try to find something where, what's your passion? What do you want to do? What do you enjoy? And I was lucky enough to find that I really enjoy and kind of have the knack for teaching and relating with the students in the classroom. Right. That's so interesting that you said that. I feel like my college experience was very, very similar. I was actually a math major and an English major. And, and, um, I worked as a, an actuary for one summer before my huh? senior year, and it was, it was the same thing. I was studying for the actuarial exam, and we're doing all this, like, modeling for, like, I don't know, death rates, <laughs> like, maximize benefits and retirement plans for insurance companies, and I really was sitting there being like, I, I do not want to do this, mm. you know, and much less for a year, but imagine doing it for decades, and, and it was that same sort of thing that moment of you know what I've got to find something that that I love um, and I think that's great advice for students is really listen to yourself you might think that you want to do one thing but when you're actually in it and doing it do pay attention because life is long your career is long you know and if you're, yeah. you're not enjoying it that early on you don't want to stick with it the long in the long run yeah find something you love well and I can say I appreciate the fact that you went into teaching because as you know, anybody watching this, I'm sure they don't know, I had my own daughter take your class because all the interactions we've had, you know, I know you as a person, what I've heard from other students, they love you. And so my daughter was in your class and she loved you as well. So it was, it, it was a nice, it worked out really well. And so I, I appreciate the, the passion you have for teaching and for, you know, doing things like this. Yes, where, you know, making it easier for students to understand, making it easier for parents and other teachers to, you know, kind of get a, a feel for doing the best they can. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I'm trying to think, I think, is there anything else? Otherwise, I think we're, we're just about out of time. Um, but I think we've covered a ton, a ton, actually, of, of helpful things, hopefully, for, for teachers. I can imagine that there's a lot of teachers who learned a lot of helpful tips from you today yeah no i i you know i hope they did i mean i i thank you for what you're doing because I, I appreciate the fact that you're reaching out to you know just to help other people and that's you've got a knack for it 
And I, you know, it's something that I can't do, but I think you're, you're, you're past in both math and, you know, you were saying in English, both come together and you're able to write books and you're able to do things that, you know, that's not me. You know, I'd be more a creative writer and I'd make <laughs> things up. And that's probably not what they're, they're looking for. It helps me come up with examples when I'm trying to explain things to students. Well, think about it this way. And I like to do analogies. Um, but <laughs> Math analogies, yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. I'm so, um, so excited to have gotten a chance to interview you. And I, I appreciate you taking the time to do this so much. Well, thank you, Allison. I had fun. It was good being here. And best of luck to you. Thank you. And if you're listening, thank you so much for listening with us today. Um, I will see you next week.